Tonight on To The Point. It's not worth it for anyone who wants to exploit a child. The new law cracking down on trafficking a child. The penalties they could now face and why some say it's not harsh enough. Plus an infant found dead in a Lodi parking lot. The latest on the investigation. The warm up continues through the weekend and into next week. How hot we could get and the fire concerns we'll be facing. And later, Vice President Harris visiting the southern border for the first time in three years. What she said about immigration. Good evening. Thank you for ending your week here with us on To The Point. I'm Alex Bell, supporting survivors of human trafficking and going after the people who fuel that industry. Those are the goals of four bills Governor Newsom signed into law this week, and one of them unlocks harsher penalties for people who purchase minors for sex. ABC 10's Becca Habegger spoke with a survivor of trafficking about why this bill is so important. Jenna McKay met her trafficker when she was 17 years old. I went to a private school. I was headed to play college volleyball and I was lured out of high school um, by a, a boy that was just a year older than me. And I was sold down the street from my school that and my community that I grew up in um, for almost a year. She has since turned her trauma into advocacy, like working to pass State Senator Shannon Groves Senate Bill 1414. People that buy children for sex in the state of California should go to prison. Currently, paying for sex with a minor is just a misdemeanor. A person could spend as few as two days in jail. Is you know, two days in jail, mandatory minimum enough to address a child's trauma? Absolutely not. Um, that'll never be enough. And felony, you know, convictions will never be enough, but hopefully it's enough to stop and begin some actual, see some deterrence in our community. Sonia Martinez Satchel with the Sacramento District Attorney's Office says Senate Bill 1414, which Governor Newsom signed Thursday and will go into effect next year, unlocks harsher penalties. For a repeat offender buying sex with a child 17 and under, prosecutors will be required to charge them with a felony. It's not worth it for anyone who wants to exploit a child. For someone charged for the first time with buying sex with a child 15 and under, prosecutors can opt to charge them with a felony. If the victim is 16 or 17, the person buying sex can be charged with a felony only if the teen is a victim of trafficking, according to the new law. A compromise that upset Senator Grove, who wanted all minors, 17 and under, to be fully protected by this law. This bill is incredibly overbroad, uh, in my opinion. Senator Scott Weiner was among those concerned that the original bill could have unintended consequences. This bill will sweep in a lot of people who are not trafficking. Ultimately, Grove's bill passed with the changes. McKay says it's not perfect, but it is a step in the right direction. It will make a big difference in victims' lives and their healing journeys. Um, getting that justice is a huge piece of the healing um, work that they'll have to endure. So there's still a lot of work to do, but this is definitely a step in the right direction. All right, Becca Habecker joining us now. Becca, let's talk about some of the other bills that Newsom also signed. Yeah, so one requires hospital emergency rooms to adopt policies allowing patients to confidentially disclose if they're a victim of trafficking. Uh, another requires law enforcement agencies to create guidelines for officers interacting with survivors of trafficking. And that fourth one is aimed at labor trafficking, not necessarily sex trafficking. It establishes a new labor trafficking unit within the Department of Justice, which, among other things, will collect and traffic uh, track reports of labor trafficking. Becca, thank you so much. And Governor Newsom has also signed a bill into law that formally apologizes for California's role in slavery and the decades of anti-black policies that followed. The legislation was part of a package of reparations bills introduced this year, but was the only one that passed this cycle. Advocates for reparations say the law doesn't go far enough. It feels someone like a slap in the face for the governor to sign this apology bill the day after he vetoed one of the bills, specifically SB 1050, that would have provided restitution and compensation for black Americans who had their property taken by the state of California. Assemblywoman Lori Wilson, who chairs the Black Caucus, says state lawmakers will keep pushing for more reparations in the future. The apology bill also calls for a memorial plaque to be installed at the state capitol.
And Cal Matters reports that Governor Newsom still has around 400 bills still on his desk. He will need to sign or veto them before midnight on Monday. Tonight, a search is underway for a man who escaped from Plumas County Jail. The sheriff's office says Caleb Dewar uh, escaped the jail in Quincy around 8 this morning. Deputies say he is considered dangerous. He was last seen walking on County Road A23 in Beckworth. And if you see him, make sure that you call 911. Turning now to an investigation in Lodi after store employees found a dead baby in the parking lot of a business. Lodi police say that it happened in the area of Tokay and Sacramento streets on Thursday. An employee tells us that they were sitting in a parking lot when they spotted the body of the newborn baby just lying on the concrete. He ran over to tell his co-worker who did call 911 and now they are pleading for the mother and whoever knows more to come forward. Gonzalez says so that there is justice for the baby. He was a boy. I saw he was a boy. And more than anything, to seek justice for the angel who wasn't at fault for any of this. Again, if you know anything about the baby and how it got there, please give Lodi police a call. And as a reminder, all Lodi fire stations are safe surrender sites. Turning now to the aftermath of Hurricane Helene, the massive storm made landfall late Thursday along Florida's Big Bend region as a Category 4 storm with sustained winds of over 140 miles per hour. At least 40 deaths are being blamed on the storm across three states. And tonight, Governor Gavin Newsom says that California will be sending 151 search and rescue members to areas impacted by the hurricane. And it comes as much of Florida's Gulf Coast has been destroyed, including Cedar Key, which you are seeing that video right now. You can see the damage left behind from dangerous storm surge, flooding, and strong winds. After making landfall, Helene traveled inland towards Georgia. A flash flood emergency was issued in Atlanta after more than 10 inches of rain fell and multiple people had to be rescued. We went downstairs to check on everyone and then we started getting floated away and the boat came right in time to save us. Georgia's governor calling Helene a deadly storm, confirming nearly a dozen deaths in the state, including a first responder. North Carolina's governor says there have been numerous landslides in his state and at least 100 water rescues. Helene, which is now a tropical depression, is currently stalled out over Kentucky and Tennessee, where flooding forced people onto a roof of a hospital. The storm is expected to bring more rain and wind to the southeast this weekend. Still ahead on to the point, Vice President Harris visiting the southern border, plus Donald Trump meeting with the Ukrainian president. Highs today in those mid-90s, but even warmer temperatures to come. How hot we could get into next week. And later on the back roads, we head over to Calaveras County to see what it's like to go more than 100 feet underground. All right, meteorologist Carly Gomez with our forecast tonight. You are tracking a weather impact alert coming. That's right. We're looking at hot temperatures, which we've been used to for most of the summer. But the alert isn't just for the heat. It's also for the potential for fire outbreaks. Big fire concerns expected as we kick off next week. The warming trend continues into the weekend with mid 90s. One day in the low 90s on Sunday with dry and windy weather kicking up for us on Monday. Then as we move into Tuesday, the fire concerns here are elevated as the gusty winds will be coming in out of the north. Now high pressures in place that'll continue to strengthen and build overhead. Now take a look here. You see that band of clouds that's going to start moving in for us. Partly cloudy skies as we start moving from Saturday to Sunday, but it may just make it feel a little bit more humid. Mostly clear skies overhead, but wind gusts pick up by tomorrow evening. 15 to about 25 miles per hour, then slowing down for us on Sunday. By Monday, though, winds start coming in out of the north for us, starting in the morning hours through the coastal range, then more impactful for us on Tuesday. That's where we get the fire concerns. Now, taking a look here, the ridge builds overhead hot as we move into Tuesday and even Wednesday. As late as Wednesday, we could see triple-digit heat, but then a big trough starts to move into our area. We're hoping that sticks around because if it does, that would drop temperatures for us as much as even into the low 80s to maybe even mid 80s by the following weekend. If not, 
will still be looking at temperatures in the 90s. Now, 94 to about 96 degrees over the next three days, but Sunday will be your cooler day for us in the low 90s with partly sunny skies. Then here's your big weather impact alert day for Tuesday. Now, after Tuesday, we could still see that heat for us on Wednesday, so just keep that in mind. We could still see temperatures, even records broken for one or two of those days. As we start moving toward the following weekend, those temperatures in the upper 80s. Next on to the point, the latest on the race for the White House as Harris visits the southern border and Trump meets with Ukrainian President Zelensky. Plus, Sacramento leaders pushing to make Sacramento State part of the Pac-12. What could make it happen? Tonight in your voice, your vote, Vice President Kamala Harris visiting the southern border today in Arizona. The trip marks her first visit since becoming the Democratic nominee. Harris is looking to focus on immigration, where former President Donald Trump has been leading in the polls. Vice President Kamala Harris making her first trip to the southern border in more than three years. There are consequential issues at stake in this election. And one is the security of our border. The United States is a sovereign nation, and I believe we have a duty to set rules at our border and to enforce them. The Democratic nominee calling for tougher security measures and outlining a plan to crack down on fentanyl smuggling and human trafficking. Securing our border also means addressing the flow of fentanyl into our communities. Harris also criticizing her opponent's stance on immigration. But a Fox News poll shows more voters in Arizona say they trust former President Donald Trump on the issue. At a rally in Michigan today, Trump mocked Harris's border visit. This is bad timing for Kamala to show up today at the border. She didn't go there for four years. Harris also pushing for more border agents and resources, which were included in a bipartisan border security bill Trump successfully urged Republicans to block earlier this year. This comes as the latest numbers from Customs and Border Protection show encounters at the southern border are down compared to last year after the Biden administration imposed new asylum restrictions. Meanwhile, former President Donald Trump met with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky today. The two have clashed over how to end the war in Ukraine and today brought their differences behind closed doors. I think uh, if we win, I think we're going to get it resolved very quickly. Very well. I really think we're going to get it resolved. I hope we have more good relations. We're going to have. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think but, Ukraine but, you know, it takes two to tango. Harris also met with Zelensky this week and vowed to stand alongside Ukraine until it defeats Russia. New York City Mayor Eric Adams pleaded not guilty today to federal charges. Adams has been charged with wire fraud, bribery, conspiracy, and receiving campaign contributions from a foreign national. Adams was fingerprinted after surrendering to authorities this morning, and he was later released. His attorney says they plan to dismiss the case. There are no emails, text messages, or any corroboration whatsoever that the mayor knew about anything having to do with these campaign donations. The entire body of evidence is one staffer, one staffer that says there was a conversation. What you have not learned is that that staffer has lied and the government is in possession of that lie. Adams will be back in court Wednesday. He has denied the claims and vowed to stay in office. Sacramento State University, the city's business community and political leaders are all in on joining the Pac-12. Less than 24 hours after announcing a new stadium, another press conference was held to show the community's commitment. There is a cost for joining the Pac-12, of course. The business community and Sac-12 Executive Council estimating they will need $50 million for a competitive name and likeness and $5.25 million for conference joining fees. With the CSU system facing budget cuts, the Economic Council says monetizing sports is a solution. Sac State builds out an athletic program to include more student involvement Soccer is a great example, which student soccer will play here. You know, you're going to be able to pay for that now through the revenue of a Pac-12 caliber football team. The Pac only has to take one more team to meet NCAA standards. Community leaders say Sacramento has something that the Pac-12 needs. This is a top 20 television market, which will give the conference the ratings they need for revenue.
time for another trip on the back roads tonight. John Bartell taking us to Calaveras County to explore one of the deepest caves in California. In December of 1851, the Daily Alta California newspaper describes the discovery of a deep, dark cavern in Calaveras County. Miners who lowered themselves to the bottom claimed they found skeletons, while others who passed by the entrance heard strange noises. That's where rock music comes from. <laughs> Well, that probably wasn't the noise the miners heard back then, but this is the cavern they discovered. The original entrance to the cavern, that hole that was discovered during the gold rush in the 1850s, the other end of it is right here on the other side of the sledge. This is Moaning Caverns, the largest single cave chamber in California. Just remember to hold on to the railing. And if you want to make it to the bottom, you're going to have to follow cave naturalist Serena Barth. Is there, is there any cave creatures in here? Nothing lives in the cave. One reason there's no cave creatures is due to the narrow entrance. It's a tight squeeze. It's a good thing I didn't have a big breakfast this morning. <laughs> Before the installation of steps and lighting, Serena says tourists were lowered down into the cave while sitting in a bucket. Think about the size of half a wine barrel. So you had the anchor back that way somewhere. And then you had a like a hand crank or a wheel that your guides would lower you down on. Lucky for us, in 1922, owners of the cave built this 100-foot tall spiral staircase. There was a lot of steps. How many steps did I walk down? 235 total, 144 of which are on the spiral staircase. Ooh. Building the spiral staircase was quite an engineering feat. Construction crews started from the top, welding bits and pieces of steps from an old World War I battleship together until they hit the bottom. Why is it called Moaning Caverns? Well, because when you walk back up all of the stairs, you're moaning by the time you get to the top. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> the real reason for the name Moaning Caverns actually has to do with the sound that dripping water makes when it hits the bottom of the cave. This cavern's very, very echoey, and that sound can be heard on the surface sounding like a hum or a moan. So, how, what's it sound like, huh? Like a hmm. The curious noises attracted many early people to discover the cave, but those noises also have a dark side. Um, we do have some history of indigenous people thousands of years ago falling into the cavern, most likely because of the moaning noise. Along with the strange noises, you'll also get to experience a number of geological wonders. So stalactites are the ones that hang tight to the ceiling. Stalagmites might reach the ceiling someday. They grow upward from the ground. The cavern itself was formed by water erosion and shifting of the earth, but the unique formations on the cave walls are a result of calcite deposits in the water that stick to each other over for a really long time. How old do we think this cave is? Approximately 10 million years old. That's, that's old. That's pretty old. No matter which direction you look, you'll find spectacular formations, but what you won't find in the cavern is gold. No gold was found in Moaning Caverns, nope. It's kind of a good thing though, right? It is. It's a good thing because I suspect that the gold miners probably wouldn't have been kind to the cavern formations had there been gold found around them. Well, getting to the bottom of the cave is the easy part, but going up, it's another story. They call this the uh, noggin knocker here. You do not want to hit your head on that. And you don't want to get left behind because when Serena leaves, she shuts the lights off. Uh -oh. From Moaning Caverns, I'm John Bartell. Hope to see you on the back roads. Now it's your turn. If you have something you think would be a great road trip destination, let John know about it. Just text your idea to 916-321-3310. Stay with us. We're back after this break. It's a story that we first brought you here on to the point. A Fair Oaks-based company anchored tiny homes, sold tiny homes or ADUs to people looking to expand. But hundreds of Northern California families say that the company took their money and left their projects unfinished. Coming up after Monday Night Football at 1030, ABC 10's Jeannie Nguyen sits down with homeowners whose investments are in limbo. Some say they are hundreds of thousands of dollars and they've lost it and they're concerned that they're never going to see that money again. They were touted as, you know, the country's premier ADU builder. How many of you paid Anchor Tiny Homes more than $10,000 to complete your project? $50,000, 100000 
what's now being done to hold the company accountable. Watch after Monday Night Football at 1030 only on ABC 10. And to the point is back on Wednesday due to football, of course. And then on uh, Tuesday, we have the vice presidential debate. So as always, thank you so much for watching. Have a great weekend. I'll see you on Wednesday. And don't forget, you can always download our free ABC 10 app to stream our stories wherever you are. Hey, it's Alex. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching the To The Point team and I love hearing from you and I hope that you'll stay in touch. And don't forget, you can always email me and the team at to the point at abc10.com or you can even send us a text message at 916-321-3310.